human brain remains one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. We need to understand how we think, how we make decisions, like you've seen with the previous speaker, how we speak, how we see, and there's still a lot of work to do. But perhaps, most importantly, we have to understand the mechanisms that lead to conditions like Alzheimer's disease, which affect one out of every 60 Americans. Parkinson's disease, one out of every 300 Americans, but also neuropsychiatric disorders like depression, 10% of the population in the US is affected, or schizophrenia, 1% of the population. I want to focus on a different neurological disorder that is called ataxia. It is a much more rare disease. It affects roughly one out of every, every 50 to 100,000 Americans, and it leads to symptoms like lack of coordination, balance, control of your movement. Ataxias can have genetic disease, and perhaps the most uh, common form of ataxia with genetic disease is called Friedrich's ataxia by the name of uh, the physician who first observed it in 1863 in Germany. So what is FA? Being diagnosed with FA at age 17 um, was a big blow for my family. We didn't know anything about FA before we were diagnosed. We were just kind of thrown into this situation where we've got to fight for our lives. And, you know, we were up against the wall with this diagnosis, you know, no treatment, no cure and no hope, and, um, and we found a way to start fighting back. No treatment, no cure, no hope. Uh, we can do better. Um, this is why we do what we do, and brain imaging, and in particular MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, provides us new tools to better understand what happens in our brain, but also in brains of patients like Kyle. And over the past few years, a number of large international projects have started to try to bring some answers to these questions. One of them is called the Human Connectome Project, or HCP. It's funded by the National Institute of Health. And the same with the Human Genome Project, which all of you have heard of, mapped our genes, all our genes, about 10 years ago. The Human Connectome Project aims at mapping the connections and all the way the connections of our brain and how they work together, how different parts of our brain talk to one another, function, together. So what is the brain? What are we looking at? We're looking here at a view from the side, uh, and the brain is roughly separated in three big regions. The first one is called the cerebrum. That is the major part of the brain, the upper part. This is separated into the left and the right hemisphere, and they are connected by what we call the corpus callosum. This is one of the major highways of the brain, the major connection between the left and the right side. In the back, lower part of your head is, called, is what is called the cerebellum. The cerebellum control your movement, your balance, your gain. As you can imagine, this is heavily involved in pathologies like ataxia, as we'll see a little further, a little later. In between these two uh, regions is something called the brainstem. That's what makes your body communicate with the rest of your brain, with the cerebellum and the cerebrum, and also control things like your heart rate, your respiration, pain, and so on. So if you look a little more carefully inside the brain, uh, you can see two main colors, the gray and the white. The gray is what we call the gray matter, the cortex, the subcortex, regions where calculations are done, computations. And these different regions are connected to one another by the white matter. These are the wires. And if you can make the analogy with the internet, this is a map of all some of the computers in the internet. The cortex really is those computers, the calculation, the CPUs, and the wires are the white matter the axons, the neurons, the highway, the connections in your brain. And there's about 100 billion of them, 100 billion neurons in your brain. They make connections or synapses in the cortex, in the subcortex, and there is just in the cortex about 150 trillion of these connections. And to do this, it requires roughly 100,000 miles of axons to create these connections. So this is a map of the brain's wiring generated from data from the Human Connectum Project. This surface that you're seeing now, this white surface, is the boundary between the white matter and the cortex. So it's the, the boundary between these two regions. The lines, these 3D lines, these colored lines, are approximation of the wires, of the neurons, the connections. The color tells you something about their orientation. 
If it's red, it means that the connection goes from the left to the right side of your head. If it's green, it goes from the back to the front of your head. If it's blue, if it's blue it goes from the bottom to the top of your head. So, how do, how do we generate maps like this? And what can we do with them? We use big, strong magnets. This is an example of a 7 Tesla MRI system at the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Minnesota here. Tesla is the unit that measures the strength, the power of an MRI machine, and it's roughly 20,000 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. To give you a reference, hospitals usually uh, use magnets that are 1.5 to 3 Tesla. This is a 7 Tesla magnet, which we use for many of our studies. And so if you imagine laying on that table, this magnet really acts like a very strong magnet. And the human body is composed of a lot of water. Water is composed of two kinds of atoms, oxygen and hydrogen. The core of the hydrogen atom acts like a little magnet, a little compass. And you can see these little compasses around the stronger magnet. They align themselves with that magnet. This is how our MRI works. All the hydrogen cores in your body are aligned, organized along this axis, this red, this, this stronger magnet. And what we do then to generate images, slicing through your brain and imaging slice by slice different regions of your brain is to use this device that we call a coil. Wraps around your head and it just perturbs this aligned, organized state. And when we release this perturbation, water molecule, actually the hydrogen part of them, go back to their aligned state and they emit a signal. We can capture that signal with the same coil and generate images like this. This is a view from the front, and we're slicing through the brain. You can see that different regions have different colors or different intensities. This is due to the variation in water content and the difference in anatomical regions we're looking at. And so we can generate exquisite, very high resolution images of the brain. And this has been extremely helpful for the field of radiology, medical imaging, to better understand the conditions stroke, brain uh, tumor, uh, use uh, very useful in surgery as well. However, it doesn't give us information about the wiring, the connection that we were just looking at earlier. The same way water molecule can be used, their hydrogen part can be used to generate images like this, they also move all the time. They're, they diffuse, they move all the time. And if you look at an example here, a very simple example of a dye, a little bit of water that's dropped, in a container with water, this is what diffusion does. It just, it just diffuses, fills that container until it reaches the boundary. Think about it the same way in the brain. Water diffuses and it will hit, it will reach boundaries that are created by the membranes of the axon. And to understand how we can generate images using that concept, all you need to do is to look at this beautiful image of a highway at night and think of the water molecule as the headlights or the taillights and the wires, the connections, as the highway. You can't see the highway, but you can see the lights. Therefore, you can deduct, you, can, you know that there is a highway. It is the exact same thing with diffusion MRI. We can't see the wires directly, but we can see how water molecule moves. Therefore, we can deduct how the wires are organized and where they go. So that allows us to go from this, which is a very static view of the brain without the connectivity information, to something like this. And if you zoom in, you see this more exquisite information about connections, about these fibers, these highways in, in the brain. The Human Connector Project, which I already mentioned, um, has leveraged, leveraged this concept and pushed them to the limit to try to better understand not only how the brain is connected, but also with different imaging modality, how different regions work with one another. It is an amazing team of over 100 people all over the world uh, in 10 institutions. Washington University in St. Louis, where David Van Essen on the left here leads the project, as well as the University of Minnesota here, uh, with Camille Ugrobiel, who also leads the project, are involved in this project along with many other institutions. And <clears throat> the goal of the Human Connecting Project is to scan 1,200 healthy individuals
to generate a map of a healthy human brain, to understand how our brain is connected, how different regions talk to one another. And so this will be generated using a three Tesla system. You remember the Tesla is the unit that gives us information about the power of the, of the magnet. But beyond diffusion MRI, as I said, all the modalities will be used to understand how the brain functions as well. Ultimately, some of these subjects will also be scanned at 7 Tesla here at the University of Minnesota on that same system that I showed just earlier. And that will give us information with even more details. Um, we'll have information about behavior, geno genotyping, and also information from functional imaging like MEG and EEG, which will provide us even more information. This is the scanner that is being used currently and has been used for the past two or three years to scan uh, the subject. It was brought to the university, customized, optimized, put back on a truck, and then went to WashU, where it's now being used to generate that data. This is an example of the data we are able to achieve. This is the fusion MRI. The color here gives you the same information as the color on these lines. The bottom is a conventional MRI image obtained from a 3T system. The top is what the human connectome has been able to achieve so far. And you can see how much crisper, how much more information we're able to gain. This will help us better understand how the brain is wired. But it's not, that's not it. There is more. The 70 data is coming. And you can see now the bottom is the, the human connectome 3T data, the top is the human connectome 7T data, which we are just starting to acquire. Even more information, even more detail about the connectivity uh, for the human brain. So, and other technology that has been leveraged by the human connectome project, and that we are using now for many of our studies, allows us to overcome one of the limits of MRI, which is the ability to only look at one slice at a time. This is the conventional way data is acquired, slice by slice. This technology has allowed us to look at two, three, four, five slices simultaneously. And as you can imagine, if we can do this, we can get more data in the same amount of time or just cut the time of acquisition, which is extremely important when we do study with, with patients. This is Kyle again. So how, how can we use all this to better understand what happened, for instance, in a taxi? So Kyle, um, rose awareness for Taxia, was money, money. He did this very long race about three years ago, 2010, with three of his teammates called the Race Across America. It's a bike ride that goes from California to Maryland, 3,000 miles, uh, over 150,000 feet of elevation. And he did that on his trike, again, because of issues with balance and because of, of FA. So he came to the university to participate in our study where we uh, used everything that I've explained so far, diffusion MRI, this ability to scan and obtain data faster to try to better understand how the wires, how the connections are affected in this disease and try to potentially understand how this could help us to understand the progression of, of the disease. So you're seeing him being set up on one of our 3 system. And so this is an example of a healthy control and a patient with FA. I bet you it's difficult for you to see the difference because the only difference that you can see really is when you focus on that part of the image, which is the spinal cord. It's thinner on the right. This is, this is the image from, from one of our uh, patients. And that's the hallmark of FA, atrophy of the cord. The rest of the brain looks relatively normal. And this is because this is a standard image. It's not diffusion imaging. We cannot see very much differences. We looked at a set of patients and controls, and this is the outer part of the brain, and what we were aiming to do is to try to better understand how damages occur, how alterations occur, and where they occur. This is what you can see here in red. These are all the voxels, the location, the specific areas in the brain that are altered, damaged because of that disease. And this really informs us about why patients experience speed problems visual problems and so on, because some of the wires that connect region involved in the vision, for instance, in the vision system, for instance, are here uh, identified using this technology. So what's next? What's the future? This is a 10.5 Tesla system, the first and only one in the world. This is the world's most powerful MRI. The University of Minnesota, uh, with funding from the NIH, 
was able to obtain and have this system manufactured. It is now here at the CMR. It weighs about 110 tons, which is twice the weight of a Boeing 737. It has about 800 miles of wires to generate this strong magnetic field. And this is what we are going to use. And in combination with the technique that I've explained, diffusion MRI, to better understand how different brain regions are connected to one another, this fast acquisition technique that allows us to get a lot of data fast, to ultimately better understand how our brain works, but also potentially better understand how diseases like FA affect the brain, and when treatment, if treatment becomes become available, how effective they are. Thank you.